good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to begin by telling you something about my work. So these are some of the books I have written. Uh, the first column is about my children's books. Um, it's an identity card for Krishna, which tells the story of Krishna trying to get into the airport. And he's not allowed to because he doesn't have an ID card. And uh, he tries to use his influence as a god. It doesn't work. Uh, and then there's a story uh, of Shiva plays Damshrats. If you go across India in the temples, you will see all the deities have certain hand gestures. They're called mudras. And unfortunately, we sort of make them very exotic and mystical and magical, but they're really Damshrats, really. They're trying to tell you things, like this means don't be afraid. It's a simple symbol which means that. Uh, can you close the door? Then, of course, these two stories are the main epics of India. That's Mahabharata, which was published about three years ago. This is Ramayana, which just released, fresh from the press. That is, that is on Shiva, that's on Vishnu, that's on calendar art, which is very popular across India, but people really don't know how to read them. It's a language that people don't understand. And finally, the book, uh, Business Sutra, which talks about management principles using an Indian approach. You see, um, how many of you are management students? Any management students here? <laughs> so about uh, at least 90% of the books that you will read are written most by men, not by women. And we don't think about it, right? Imagine if all the books were written by women. Would the management principles be different? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if all the books, and then we don't notice that most of the writers are Europeans and Americans. What if all the writers were Arabs? Would the management principles be different? I see the muted response to that. <laughs> um, what if all the books were written by Japanese? Would the principles be different? And that led me to the question that if it is written by, what would um, it be based on uh, Indian philosophy? And lots of ideas came, and of course I'm not going to explain everything today. I'm just going to show you one point to show you the difference. I, I use a word called mythology that sometimes disturbs and rankles a lot of people. So I'll begin with that by so that people can understand what it means. Because when people use the word mythology, they have a very old 1950s definition which your grandfather had. And most academicians don't use that word anymore. It's a very different meaning today. But we have not updated our database. So uh, let's look at this. To understand this, you have to understand, ask yourselves a few questions. Look at this. 9 by 11, 9 11. What does it mean? September 11th or 9th of November? It depends where you come from. Right? So students in Indian school would be told that is 9th of November because they follow the British system of dating, which is DD, MN, YY. But if you're in America, then the dating system is MN, DD, YY. And the American system evolved because when the colonies were being created, when America became a republic, it wanted to distance itself from the old motherland, from Europe, wanted to, from all that Europe represented, feudalism, monarchy. It wanted to represent itself as a republic, a democracy. And so it used various methods to distinguish itself. One of the methods was it would date itself differently. Other systems are, for example, the switches. I don't know how many of you all know this is only there in America. You go up and down differently. It's opposite if you go to Britain, if you go to Europe, if you go to India. <coughs> we don't notice it. The question is, which is the right method of dating? What is the universally right method of dating? DDMMYY or MMDDYY? Yeah. You're in America, I remember that. <laughs> And that's where the question comes, which is the right method? And suddenly, a simple thing like dating, something just, I mean, please, when I'm saying dating, it doesn't mean dating. <laughs> right, <laughs> evening, and the guy talking about dating. So sorry. Yeah, so I'm just talking about how you date. Oh, sorry, that's my <laughs> Okay, I'm really getting into it. Right? So, is it DDMMYY or is it MMDDYY? And you realize suddenly that the truth varies with geography. What is correct varies with geography. What is correct in the North America is not correct in Europe. What is correct in Europe is not correct in America. And suddenly you realize truth is not as rigid as we imagine it to be. It is contextual. 
It changes with space. So now, what does this word mean? What does gay mean? <laughs> what did it mean to Jane Austen? Anybody's read Jane Austen? She would write about gay afternoons. It's not the same meaning today, right? It has a totally different meaning. So the meaning has changed over time. Today, if I say he's a gay man or a gay woman, it, the eyebrows will rise, right? There's nothing innocent about it anymore. So the word has, what is the right meaning? The first one or the second one? What is correct? What is the absolute truth? You know, these words are used so casually by people that I keep on treating like, okay, I'll give simple examples and not tell me what is absolutely true. And you realize that it is a function of geography and history. It's a function of space and time. It's a function of who is speaking, when is he speaking, where is he speaking, why is he speaking, to whom is he speaking. All that is constructing that moment. Which leads me to the question, what does myth mean? So I'll give you my definition of myth. It's the easiest and simplest definition that I've found and very practical, you can apply it wherever you want. Myth is subjective truth. Myth is subjective truth. Your truth and my truth. So if I meet you for coffee at Starbucks, in order to have a good conversation with you, what should I focus on? The truth that neither you know nor I know? Or my truth and your truth? I focus on your truth, you focus on my truth, and we have a great conversation. But the moment the truth creeps into this conversation, I will say my truth is the truth and your truth is not the truth. And that leads to argument, conflict. And that's a dangerous path to walk on. And the world is full of conflicts. We don't need another one. Myth is about my truth. So let's say you're traveling to Papua New Guinea and you meet a bunch of people who have never ever been exposed to what we call civilization. How do you connect with them? Do you decide that they are savages? Or do you say, hey, let us understand their truth? How do they look at the world? What is their notion of life, death, love, hate, property, power, sexuality, all these things? And suddenly your mind becomes more curious. You move from being a judge to being a researcher. You start exploring. Try doing this in human relationships and you'll see something wonderful happening. Meet your friend and say, you know what, I want to know what is his truth. What is her truth? What are my parents' truth? Why do they behave in this strange way? Rather than saying, what is the right way for parents to behave? We all create this benchmark of how parents should behave. And then we sort of say, B, B minus, C, C minus. <laughs> Rather than saying, what is their truth? Where are they coming from? And the same thing applies to cultures. We are all very sure how people should behave. But we're not looking at how people are. Who are these people that we meet? Myth is therefore for me subjective truth. The word myth, myth comes from the Greek word mythos, which means story, a good story. Now if I ask you, tell me something about yourself, what will you tell me, the truth or the story of your life? So in an interview, you're called and I say, tell me something about yourself in the next two minutes. And you start by saying something. Is that true? Is it verifiable? Or is it just a good story that enables me to understand who you are? If I ask 10 more people, they just might say that that's not true, that's rubbish. But the fact is that's the truth I want to present to the world about myself. That's my truth. That's my version of who I am. That's me. How do I express it? I express it through stories and symbols and rituals. We'll come to that a little later. I use the word myth, I use another word for myth, I use the word belief. Many people assume that the word belief has something to do with religion. But belief is subjective truth. My version of the truth. It could be religious, it could be secular, it could be political, it could be anything. It could be rational, it could be irrational, it's my version of the truth. So how many in this room have fallen in love? 
Is that truth or your version of the truth? <laughs> is there a software and a checklist that can prove and a blood test that you're actually in love? No. You believe you are in love. Your parents are convinced it's infatuation. <laughs> but for you, it's real, right? That experience is wonderful and delightful as long as it lasts. Yeah? Unfortunately, it doesn't last long. <laughs> That's not long. For me, myth is belief. Another word I use, and this is perhaps the most disturbing word for some people, myth is assumption. What is the assumption on the basis of which you live your life? All of us have a set of assumptions. So some believe that God exists. Some believe God does not exist. Both are assumptions. And that shapes your decision-making process. Some believe that beautiful people are good people. Some people believe, if I become beautiful, I will become successful. These are beliefs and assumptions that shape the way we conduct ourselves. And that's assumption. Um, a business plan. Before you start a business plan, you have a set of assumptions. Change these assumptions, and the business plan changes completely. And so it is with assumptions. All of us have certain assumptions. When I get this degree, I'll get a fabulous job. How many people have this assumption? Yeah, depressing. This is a jaded old man talk. Yeah. My parents assume that after I do medicine, I'll practice medicine. <laughs> and now they've changed their business plan completely. <laughs> but that's assumption. So let us understand myth a slightly more from a neuropsychological way, from a neuroscientific way. But I will use a metaphor for this. I'm going to use a very traditional metaphor to help you understand this. So first question, how many of you are from South India? or have visited South India. Okay. So you will know this will be familiar to you, many of you. It's called, in Northern India it's called a Rangoli, in Southern India it's called a Kolam. It's a Tamil word, in Andhra Pradesh it's called Muggu. Now it is essentially, look at this house in front of it, you can see a pattern, that's called a Kolam. It's an art created by women. It's an exclusively women's art. How is it created? It's created every day. It's, it's to be done every day. The way you brush your teeth every day to feel fresh. The woman of the house creates the muggu or the column to refresh the house. So you can see it over here. She's doing it. She's watered the ground and she's doing it by using powdered rice or not even uh, artificial powder, white powder. Essentially, what is a column? A column is a set of dots. A grid of dots that you join or enclose with a single line. And the rule is very simple. That single line should include all the dots and create a symmetrical pattern. That These are two rules. One, it should include all dots. Two, it should be symmetrical. It can't be randomly joined. So look at this. A very complex pattern, but it is symmetrical. And she does it with great ease. It is done in about five or ten minutes every day in the morning. Now, our mind is like this column. The dots there represent data and information. The dots there represent data and information that you're exposed to since childhood. Every minute, you're exposed to data and information. Right now, you're being exposed to new data and information. How you dot, uh, join the dots is your myth. How do you make sense of all these dots? So, Unconsciously, you're joining these dots to create all these dots to create a radially symmetrical pattern that makes sense of life to you. So you all are, have a column with you. So about 70 people in this room, 70 columns in this room. Seven billion people on this planet, seven billion columns in this world. This is the mind column, the way you draw them, and that's how our mind works. We are continuously creating patterns. When I increase the number of dots, when I increase the number of dots, you get a complex pattern. Look at this, such a complex pattern. 
Either the woman is intuitively brilliant or she's been doing it so long that it's easy for her to join many dots. And all of us do that. Ten years ago, you were exposed to fewer data points. So your belief systems, your myths, your understanding of the world, your assumptions are very different from what they are today. Today, you're exposed to many more things, many more ideas. And so your column has expanded. And as the days progress, it will keep expanding. Some of us don't like to handle new dots, new data points. So we become rigid. We say, we don't want new data. We don't want new data because it will upset my column. <coughs> Because every new dot is going to change the pattern. But even if I don't increase the dots, I can change the way in which I join the dots. Look at this, how this lady changes the pattern. She's doing it without any sophisticated equipment. She's just creating a pattern. That same dots, more dots, and it's changing every day. And then you realize your mind is not rigid as we would like to believe. It is not static. It is not stagnant. It is continuously creating patterns, newer patterns, complex patterns, different patterns. And as you grow older, you start noticing that different people create different patterns. You start observing the patterns of people around you. The same data is seen so differently by someone else. So, so differently. And ultimately, you come to something wonderful like this. This is the festival of Mylapur in Chennai. Ordinary housewives, these are not artists, these are not Picasso, They're simple, ordinary women creating art on the street. And what do you observe here? Simple grid of dots transformed into fabulous patterns. It shows the diversity of the human mind. Or if I give the same set of dots to all of you, all of you will join it very differently, depending on your notion of what is beautiful. And each pattern is valid, is perfect, and each pattern is incomplete. And so newer ideas keep coming. So when I look at you, how do I understand your mind column? And that's the purpose of mythology. You can apply it to individuals, you can apply it to communities. Every community, every individual has a column in his mind. That's his truth, his version of the truth. How do I decode it? How do I understand it? How do I know I'm better? And the method is very simple. There are only three ways in which we communicate ourselves and our truths to other people. We do it through stories, symbols, and rituals. And this is true for every human being on this planet. It has nothing to do with being Indian or not Indian. Therefore, that image is Medusa, it's from Greek mythology. It is communicating an idea. So let's look at stories. Let's take examples of how stories communicate ideas. So have you met a person who's constantly complaining? Have you met those? Everybody has a friend like that, right? <laughs> like they're saying that, oh, how horrible the food here is, and how horrible the transport is, and how horrible the college is, and how horrible the teacher is, and how horrible back home is, and how everything is horrible. And the security is horrible, and the roads are horrible, and the people are horrible, and the politicians are horrible. And they keep saying that again, and again, and again. And if you pay attention, you realize they're revealing their column to you. Now, how do you become friends with such a person? You always agree with them. <laughs> you never disagree with them. Never ever disagree with them. If you disagree with them, they hate you. <laughs> because you're telling that your column is wrong. You have to tell, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, people are horrible people. <laughs> symbols. How do we communicate through symbols? Have you met people who always dress in black? Or always wear colorful clothes, bright colorful clothes, really gaudy, unsuitable for them? But they will wear it. You're communicating something. These are symbols through which you communicate. The car that you drive, the phone that you have, um, the way you organize your bulletin board, everything is communicating something about you. Your kitchen reveals so much about you. How do you keep, where do you keep the cups? Where do you keep the saucers? Is it organized? Is it, is it not organized? All these are symbolic communications of your truth. And finally, rituals. There are people who always come on time, and people always come. 
Everything reveals something. Yeah? Okay. So how do I see cultures? So let's expand. This session is about helping you, enable you to expand the way you see the world. But how do you make sense of life? I think we'll come to here, the space here. No space there. So. Right? So what I'll do now is I'll take you through a series of six slides. They are really three sets of two slides each. It deals with culture and I want you to see them and try to see what patterns. Remember this is not an exact science. It's speculative, highly speculative. But it, I just want to give you an example of how mythology works. And you will see something interesting about humans, about cultures, about life. right? So I'm sorry, I'm going to begin with something a little morbid. Look at this picture. In some parts of the world, when you die, the body is embalmed, dressed up, put in a coffin, and buried under the ground. And the point where you are buried is marked with a tombstone. Your name is written on it. Your date is written on date of birth, date of death, maybe the names of your loved ones. And it's a permanent marker. Ten years later, if you visit the site, you will find the marker there, unless it has been vandalized. Right. So if you go to Egypt, for example, I see the great tombstones, I see the great pyramid. And I know that several thousand years ago, there was this great and powerful man who was buried there. And lots of resources were used to build this great pyramid. It's still there. The marker is still there. The marker of that man's life. When you go to India, you see the Taj Mahal which contrary to popular belief is not a palace, it's a tomb. And it's a tomb of a lady, of a loved by a king, who bankrupted his entire land to build the structure. Because that permanent marker mattered so much. So you see tombstones, it reveals a column. It's like having a permanent Facebook tag. <laughs> yeah. And then, you look at other parts of the world where they just cremate the dead. The body is burnt, the ashes are thrown in the river. No permanent tag. You cannot go and find this is where my father is kept. No, there's no, no permanent tag at all. Wiped out of memory. Two different columns. Are you seeing two patterns? And the best way to understand columns is to compare and contrast. Now we'll move from something as, I'm sorry for this morbid beginning, but it sort of clarifies the thought very clearly. Now let's go to something a little bit more lighthearted, like food. Imagine you are being invited to dinner by the Queen of England or the President of the United States. A very formal dinner, very posh. You dress up well and you have to go there and you'll be seated and in front of you will be this cutlery. And the moment you look at it, you know that it's going to be a four course meal. Soup, then starter, then main course, then dessert. Clear cutlery, instruments to eat it with. Soup spoons for the starter, for the main course, different spoons for different dishes. Highly organized. Until you finish the soup, you cannot start with the starter. Until you finish the starter, they will not serve the main course. Until you finish the main course, they will not give you the dessert. So observe the column. Sequential, step one, step two, step three, step four. Centrally controlled, all of us are going to taste the soup, exactly the same soup. We can garnish it with pepper and salt, but that's it. So there you've got it, sequential, centrally controlled, linear. Clean categories with boundaries well defined. This is an Indian meal. Look how different the column is. All things served simultaneously. <coughs> the soup, the starter, the main course, and the dessert. You can start with the dessert. You can take the starter and dip it in the soup. <laughs> it is allowed. So long as you use your right hand. 
<laughs> That's the only rule, right hand, not the left hand. And as you're eating, you'll notice something very interesting. So one of you will take rice and dal, a, sec <coughs> a second person will take uh, pickles on it, a third person will add papad on it, fourth person will add gulab jamun. <laughs> so what has effectively happened is each one has created a unique dish on the table which is unique to him. And he puts it in his mouth. So what he puts in his mouth is unique to him. It is the ultimate in customization. <laughs> it's what technicians call the final user experience. Right? The cook really doesn't know what you're eating. <laughs> the cook has no clue because you've prepared your own dish on the table. And we don't realize this. this is, if I give the same thali to all of you, each one will eat in a very different... Somebody will add yogurt, somebody will add curds, somebody will mix the vegetables, somebody will have plain rice with salt. <laughs> Anything. We just don't know what you're going to eat. Nobody can define your taste. So suddenly you see a very different cola. It is not centrally controlled. It is controlled by the periphery. It is not sequential, it's simultaneous. The categories are not so clear boundaries. You see a different cola. Now, which is the best way to serve food? Which is the right way to serve food? You don't answer these questions. You can't answer these questions. For example, if you get a Chinese gentleman, he will say, this is not the way you serve food, it's barbaric. You don't know where the hands have been. And then he says, this is also not the way to serve food. You don't keep weapons on the table. <laughs> the best way to eat food is the chopsticks. Now everybody will agree, from a rational point of view, food has to be nutritious, food has to be hygienic, food has to be served on time. But how do you serve food varies from culture to culture. A different column emerges, a different way of thinking emerges. Now let's look at this. A US dollar bill. How many languages are there? One. Multicultural and diverse society with one language on the currency note. This is the US Indian rupee note. How many languages are there? 18, 17, 15. We take it for granted, right? There are 15 over here, 16, 17. Seventeen languages. Again, multicultural, diverse. Does it reveal something? When I put all of these slides together, does it show a pattern? Now the problem is, you must not judge. Think of yourself as Martians. You landed on Earth and I'm showing this presentation to you. What is the pattern that you see? Come up with ideas. What do you see? Tell me. What do you see? There's no right answer here. Just give me an understanding of what it, what, what is it that you can sense. Okay. Right. So masculine, feminine, one. Okay. The right side is feminine, multi dimensional. Okay, multi dimensional. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. One is saying masculine, feminine, multi dimensional, one way of looking at it. Anything else? Inclusive. Uh, anything else? I'm going to say the left side is very homogenous, whereas the right side is kind of personalized. Okay, personalized, homogenous, somebody else said something inclusive. Inclusive. Inclusive on which side? A or B? Right side. Right side and A. I don't assume anything. You have to be clear. <laughs> this is your answer. I don't know whether it's right or wrong. I don't know. I'm just going to... You're just observing what you can see, columns. Yes. Yeah? One is centrally controlled, like a central nervous system, like a spider. Okay. Another one is like a starfish. Each part is separate, each can grow on its own, you break away one part. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. You have a question. Love, love, One side is completely closed, rigid. Closed and rigid. Other one is homogeneous and open. Homogeneous and open, so you see homogeneity there. Okay. Love. See, what I'm saying is how different columns are seen differently. Just observe. Yes. Yeah, ignoring the first image only there, okay. uh, others are like kind of simplified. It's oh. easy to understand. Yeah. Like, you know, on the right side, ignoring the first image again, is kind of diverse, so it introduces, introduces a measure of complexity. Oh, good. So, you know, basically many, many ways of looking at it. What do I see in it? When I see this, I see this. 
one and many, one life, therefore that life is precious, many lives, so no single life really matters. One experience, many experiences, one language, many languages. Two different columns and the trick is to see it, understand it, right? What is right, what is wrong? Be careful, that's the dangerous thing to do. So you have understood two mythic patterns. So in my language, I said it's a linear mythic pattern, that's a cyclical mythical pattern. Make sense a little bit? Yeah, it's, as I said, it's not exact, it sort of gives you a sense of things. Now look at this and now do an exercise for you. Compare and contrast. <laughs> This is traffic in South Korea. That is traffic in South India. <laughs> Look at the pattern. Do you see this? And yet, tell me, tell me honest, and of course, aren't you thinking like this? <laughs> Isn't it so natural to judge? And that right way, this is the way roads should be. And yet, I say, look at the pattern. It's so easy to say that's misgovernance, bad management, horrible people. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Pattern, pattern, pattern. And the world is no different. Think of this as husband and wife. <laughs> you are wrong, I am right. Allow me to be. Different pattern. But see how our mind works. We can't help but judge. It's human. We are humans, we will judge. But what if you start to understand? A new way of thinking emerges. And that's my job as a belief officer. To help people see patterns when nobody's, everybody's too busy judging. To enable people to see patterns. To recognize that every pattern is a different pattern. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you seven slides of the same image and show you seven ways in which you can see the same picture. The same picture can be seen in seven different ways. And let's see, something will provoke in your mind. It'll just make you think. It'll make you smile. It'll just make you wonder that, oh, because we all begin here, right? 99% of human beings will begin here. Why 99? All of us, 100% will begin here. But once you start this journey, your column expands exponentially because you see so many new ways of joining the dots. So I'm going to do seven different ways and let's see what you see. So here's one way. Efficiency versus diversity. One system is highly efficient, the other system is highly diverse. Which brings me to the question, do I want an efficient system or a diverse system? Indian answer. <laughs> and really you'll never achieve that. If imagine in Bombay today, you can if you only speak Kannada and you go to the police station to file a complaint, the police complaint is written in Hindi. In Marathi, sorry. Only in Marathi. So if you don't know Marathi, you are in trouble. You need a translator. So you really don't know what has been written by the police. And that complaint goes to the court, and the language of the court is English. Yes. <laughs> so do you realize efficiency and diversity? If I, because I speak English and you'll understand English, this communication is so easy. But imagine if you didn't understand English, I would need a translator. Inefficient, you have to pay for it. Efficiency, diversity, simple examples. But we, don't, we, we use the word diversity nowadays, it's the most coolest word to use everywhere. Be diverse in pluralism. And I'm like, do you have a clue what it means? I'll just show this picture. <laughs> and then suddenly you say, mm, well, it's a nice idea. <laughs> Another way of looking at it. Enforcement of one way versus empathy for many ways. What is better? I'm just letting you do, just let it soak in. There's, don't comment on it, just let it soak. Third way. Rule submission, rule averse. Sheep and goat. Dog and wolf. What do you want to be? 
excludes other ways, includes many ways. Another way of looking at it. So you're walking on the wrong side of the road, I include you too. I won't scream at you, I won't shout at you, I'll say it's fine. I'll be late, who cares? <laughs> Central control, peripheral control. My column is right, your column is also right. This is how an economist will look at it. Resource rich, homogeneous, crowded, poor, heterogeneous. They'll say some patterns will be like this. And suddenly you realize seven different ways of looking at it. Should I judge? Should I understand? And then when you understand, you're like, now what do I do? Which way do I go? Do I enforce? Do I empathize? What do I do? And that makes decision making tough. And that's what happens when you start going to new markets, new people's behaviors, customer behavior, employee behavior. Different markets when you enter, when you are starting business in different environments, you have to understand the pattern of the people with whom you're going to engage in. If you don't understand the pattern of the people with whom you're going to engage in, you will be so judgmental that you just might create all kinds of trouble. You will force your way onto it, right? So ask yourself, what do you want to be? And I'll give you two options. One is from Greek mythology, and the other is a folk tale from India. It's Indian mythology. So when you see something unfamiliar, there are two different reactions, and that's how your brain functions. One could say this is the left brain, one could say that's the right brain. It's a crude way of putting it. The Greek hero Bellerophon one day saw some, a mysterious creature that was not, he wasn't sure whether it was a goat, or a serpent or a lion. He wasn't sure what it was. He got so scared, he decided to fight it, destroy it, kill it. He kills this monster and becomes the great hero. Sometimes when we see things that is not familiar to us, we want to organize it, categorize it, classify it, control it. Right? That's what we do. On the other side is Arjun, who sees the strange creature that is part rooster, part peacock, part elephant, part human, lion, tiger, serpent, bull, deer, nine parts. It's called Navagunjara. And he says, I can't fight this creature. He lays down his weapons and worships it. And these are the options before us. When we see things that are unfamiliar, that frighten us, anything which is unfamiliar will always frighten us. Our natural reaction is to reject it and to judge it and say, my way is better than his way. But there's another option where I try to understand, which demands a lot of you, because you have to expand your column, include it, and appreciate it. But it comes at a price. It is not easy. It comes at a very heavy price. And that's what I consider leadership. The ability to include other people's point of view. And that's not easy. That's not easy at all. But I hope you find the way and are successful in whichever path you wish to take in your life. Thank you. So that was my talk. I think we have about 15 minutes for q and I think. Yeah? Who's the master of the ceremony? Is there a master of the ceremony? Sure, we do have time for questions. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the talk was wonderful. Thank you. And uh, my question is about the question of leadership. What is the point of view that one is being inclusive about itself is exclusive? Um, so, give me an example. I can get into geopolitics and talk about it, but let's say there is an ideology which believes in excluding every other ideology yes. and promote itself, yes. at the, even if it means war and death. Yes. What to do if your ideology is being inclusive to that ideology? Because you know the eventual end result that it will be. 
Well, no, it's not an eventual end result. That's one point of view. There will always be people who will disagree with that. So the leadership yes. comes into question. No, the leadership is the ability to include columns, but many leaders don't do that. They exclude and they fight. That's a common definition of leadership, right? Stick to your guns, right? Believe in yourself. Have integrity is actually means stick to your guns. Words like uh, be true to yourself means reject other people's truths. <laughs> yeah? So I'll just show the pattern. When you start seeing the patterns, what looks noble and valorous at one level is very dark from another level. So does Harry Potter include the Dark Lord? He doesn't, does he? But we valorize him. Yes. So if you go on including so many columns, so how will you excel? Then you get a lot of efficiency but no diversity. And you must be comfortable with that. That's what the leadership comes at the price. That's what I said, it's difficult. In order to be excellent, you will pay a price. That is all it means. Now you see it. Now do it. Often we're told that you should be focused at your work, but nobody tells me the price. What's the price I will pay? If I'm succeeding, hard working and just do my studies, it also means that you'll give up on extracurricular activities. And it's a price you have to pay. But you say that I want to study well and be good at extra, something else will go away. Because you're only 24 hours in a day. Right? Efficiency, diversity. Yes. Uh, this is uh, driving back to your point about how some mythologies are linear and some are cyclical. Uh, if you've seen in the last decade, I think there's this huge influx of what is called Eastern culture here mm. with an acceptance of karma as it is defined here and mm. what goes around, comes around, things like that. So do you see that superimposition of, of mythologies, perhaps subconsciously within people, as being see, detrimental in any way? See, it's, not, it's, what, it's very neurophysiological. When one idea comes, the alternative idea also emerges at the same time. That's a natural way it is. So the moment com communism as an idea rose, capitalism also rose. It's around the same time you start looking at it. This is the way human history works. For every point, there's a counterpoint. How it happens, it's, it's mysterious, but it happens. It's almost as if there's something working at it. And it always creates this alternate energies. Right? So when one I when people accept other ideas, what I normally do is I expect, accept it in my terms. So for example, I do see words like karma being used in the West, but you'll be surprised how many people explain the Bhagavad Gita using the Bible as a template. Right? So it's very different because Bhagavad Gita comes from culture which believes in rebirth. The Bible as a concept doesn't accept that. It's a different idea. But people are merging because they say something wonderful over here, there's something nice over here, let me take it from here, let me take it from there. We take words from each other. But when you see the whole column, then the problem starts. If the whole column is a little difficult to handle. I can take one dot from you, maybe two dots. You know, one curve maybe, but not everything. So we sort of create a buffet meal. Yeah, so we want a buffet meal that works for me and I say this is the right way to eat food. Yeah, but somebody in the corner is just eating sweets and saying that is also the right way to eat food. Uh, so I think one, two, and three, and then four. So can you give some examples of how you've integrated this philosophy? or this way of thinking in the future group? Uh, well, I, that's not my job. That's the CEO's job. My job is to show the pattern. So integration is easy. He wants to listen to the pattern, it's his point. It's his job. So I, as a person, never give any idea. I just show these are the patterns, you decide. So for example, we had a case of, uh, when the retail industry was new, most of the trainers came from the call center industry. And they would give these presentations and they would have a lot of students coming. So they had, it was not a very successful training program, so I went to speak to them. So I said, uh, in which language do you uh, conduct the training program? And they said, English, of course. So I said, do the audience speak English? And they said, no, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> now what is happening over here? Only one column is being seen. The right column is English, not realizing that most people who worked in industry had never, ever lived they came from shanty towns of India. They'd never even seen a proper toilet. They spoke local languages. They were very intelligent people, but they spoke local languages. But they're not exposed to an air conditioned room. They don't know what an air conditioning is. They don't know what a flush 
is. And they were working with these huge mobs. The trainer was not even sensitive to who these people were, from which part of India they came from. And they saw it as a problem, rather than empathizing with them, understanding where they came from, what language they spoke. And then that changed the training program completely, because suddenly you realize it had to be inefficient, which means you had uh, slides in different languages. And they couldn't be as detailed as the English ones, so you had the simpler slides. And at a very, very least, that happened. So what we don't realize is training program in India, North India will be different from South India. Because if in Canada, in Karnataka, they speak only Canada. In smaller towns, there is, English is not required. Hindi is not necessary. A different language is needed. So how does he understand your key performance indicator word? Tell me that in Canada. You know, for example, Hindi speakers, tell me the word strategy in Hindi. Ranaliti, battle strategy. <laughs> you realize that the only word you have is a battle example, land of Ahimsa. Yeah? Yeah, so just to show you how language is a big problem and that sensitivity didn't exist. We bring bring about that sensitivity. Yeah? Good question. Most situations in life Loud, loud. So most situations in life you have to choose one of the two ways. How yeah. do you decide which one? Like in this case, well, that's called dharma sankat, no? <laughs> like, if leadership was that easy, then I would be sitting over here and giving lectures. But that's what is happening in the world today, because you, linear thinking does, looks at problems and solutions. Cyclical thinking looks at solutions as new problems. You understand? So, there is problem and there is solution. That's a classical linear approach. I've solved the problem. Cyclical approaches go back. The solution is a problem by itself. So you start thinking bigger. So for example, you don't waste, when you start creating industry, you start thinking of waste management at the first day. You don't wait for the river to get polluted. But linear thinking is industrialization came without thinking about pollution. They didn't, why didn't they think of environment 100 years ago? Why did the nature have to get into trouble? And then the environmental sciences started. So see the history of environmental science in universities. When did it start? Why didn't it start on the first day when mechanical engineering began? Because nobody thought it through. And that's the problem. Now, linear thinking is always short term, short term. And then cyclical is go again, go back to the point of origin, go back to the point of origin. And that's what people don't understand. These are the, uh, this, the uh, this is what is called theory. So these are theories which you present to management schools which enables people to think. So I usually work only with leadership level people. It's not meant for middle management to go back. Then, yeah, one question. Well, first of all, thank you for this excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're like a chess grandmaster who sort of looks at different parties, right? And louder. You're, you're <laughs> now that must be louder. <laughs> <laughs> We never thought of seven different ways of looking at two different slides. And then you're more like a chess grandmaster who sees different multiple layers of patterns. And I was talking to my brother yesterday, he's in Bangalore. He said uh, most of the big bazaars in Bangalore are closed. Yeah. I, I asked him what's happening. He said, you know, the Walmart kind of thing in India, especially in Bangalore, it's in different localities, won't work, and many of them are kind of empty now. So and we were just discussing about a day and tournament stuff. Thinking fast and slow, and and, and and then it occurred to me: How do you see the Indian economy shape, shaping up uh, in spite of this Western economy? And you know, India itself is going through turmoil. Uh, see, the thing is, uh, people are trying repeatedly through history. They try to use Western solution for Indian problems. Right. Now, it's not rocket science; it won't work. Yeah. Uh, but we still try. We're insisting that Western solutions, which work for homogeneous markets, will work in a heterogeneous market. Now, any person with half a brain will say it won't work. But somehow, we are convincing ourselves to fail. So you believe that, look at Walmart. Look at the design of Walmart. It assumes, look at the assumptions. Person will come in a car. First assumption gets off the car because he can't shop every day. He's going to shop for a lengthy period of time. 
maybe a week, maybe a month, depending on how much his budget is and how much space he has in his car. He wants things to be done fast and efficiently. So it goes quickly through the eyes. The whole thing is designed like an efficient. Look at the size of that. Can you believe that warehouse in Bombay? How much it will cost? Yeah. It will never exist in Bombay. If something is going to exist, it will exist like you take a helicopter right out of Bombay in order to buy toilet paper. It's never going to happen. So it's not rocket science. So everybody's saying, Walmart is coming to India. I said, where? <laughs> Show me where will they set this up? And where will the parking space be? And how many Indians have a car? Who are going to drive and go and buy toilet paper 20 kilometers away from their house? Because Indians don't use toilet paper. <laughs> Little detail which we forget. Small detail which is forgotten. I'm sorry, all images are coming to you. <laughs> all those embarrassing questions that you'll have to deal with. This is, I've spoken to Walmart, and then you see that they are completely glazed. You know, we talk to the executives, they think they're dumb machines. They're not useful people. Because the bosses have said, you're going to set up Walmart in India. 10 years later, they'll realize it is not successful. They'll call McKinsey to tell them it is not successful. <laughs> and McKinsey will say, it is not successful. <laughs> and then the chief belief officer will say, yeah, right. You could have done it for a very short and small fee. But no, it doesn't work like that. Because we want to delude ourselves, it will work. And that's what happens in these markets. Uh, when um, Home Depot opened in China, everybody thought it would be successful. It failed for only one reason. You know why? Home Depot is about making your own things. And the Chinese market said, if I'm working, making money, why would I do my own thing? <laughs> the whole point of having money is someone else to do your thing. But that's not how Home Depot works because America is built on the protestant work ethic. It is based on doing your own work is glorious. But that's a very American ideal. It's not an Indian or a Chinese ideal. These are old feudal societies, thousands of years old, where the whole idea is outsource. <laughs> you don't do anything. The great Indian cook, the mother cooks, actually she shouts at Ramu or some people to do the work. And that's what people don't understand, that it is a very different mindset. Whether it's a right mindset, or I don't know. That's a moral judgment. But a business judgment. So, in the morning I was at Harvard and I was explaining this to a professor and she said the same thing. She said, you just realize that when, when you expand the data points, your conclusions change. Like any data, any science, all science students, you know, if you have more data, your conclusions change. I'm just increasing data points. And suddenly you realize, wait a minute, this definition, but that's what leadership today is. Change other people's column. Very good. Pointed out to some uh, problems with the, which the you know, Western corporations have when they function in, uh, mm. let's say, China or India. But uh, can you point out to some you know problems which the Indian companies yeah. face when uh, exploring markets? Yeah. I'll give you one example. I don't know many examples, but in this case, is just venturing out. We don't have much information. But I do know Ratan Tata's one comment when he joined a company in England. I don't know which one. But uh, it was a target company. He took it, and he said the company is sinking. The company is doing very badly, and I expect people to work late. Why is it everybody leaves office at 5 o'clock? He didn't understand. And the, or the <coughs> employees told him, but that's our contract with this company. We will work till 5 o'clock. We are giving 100%. And he kept talking about, but the company is sinking. So that's not our problem. So he saw a very different mindset. They were looking at the contract and saying, we fulfilled our contract. That's your job to get the company out. And the Indian mindset is, solve the problem. Look, don't look at that resource allocation. So it was a very different approach. Another uh, gentleman I know, but he's really in a multinational company. But he heads the multinational company. And he realized the way he conducts boardroom meetings in, uh, in Germany is very different from the way he conducts boardroom uh, meetings in Indonesia and the way he conducts it in China. A very senior gentleman. And he says, I have to be very careful. For example, in China, he never gives a decision first. He hears everyone, then gives the decision. In India, it doesn't matter whether he gives the decision or not. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to him anyway. 
in, in Germany, it's a, it's a long discussion and it's only by consensus. He cannot give a decision. It has to be a consensual. Everybody has to come to that decision. A very different approach. So they saw different parts of the world function. And he's very good at his job. So uh, he doesn't use words like column, but he intuitively understands the energy in the room. And he figures out how to figure. So he's really doing exactly what I'm saying. I'm just giving it a language and an articulation. We don't have any more questions, we hear your story. Okay. So somebody mentioned, um, I'll conclude with the story, because everybody wants to know about karma everywhere and when. So I think it's in the form of a story. Because everybody uses it in a very simple list, uh, you know, the, as you sow, so you reap. Uh, that's what is normally said for karma, but karma is not quite that. But that has an element of it, but let me explain what karma is through a story, a children's story. So um, once upon a time, there was an eagle called Garuda who saw a sparrow singing a beautiful song. And he was admiring the sparrow, listening to the song, wonderful song, listening to it. When he turned around and saw someone else watching the sparrow, and it was Yama, the god of death. And he, his heart sank because the god of death was frowning. His, his forehead was crinkled and he looked uh, upset. And Garuda said, oh god, the god of death doesn't like his song, so he's going to kill the bird. So I must save this bird. So he took the bird and took it across seven mountains, across seven rivers, and left it on a mango tree. And he flew back and returned. And when he returned, he found Yama still there, but this time Yama was smiling. And Garuda looked at Yama and said, why are you smiling? He said, you know, there was a bird here a couple of minutes ago. I was upset because this bird is supposed to die today, but not here. It is supposed to die across the seven mountains, across the seven rivers. There is a mango tree under which there is a python waiting to eat it. And I was wondering how this tiny bird with its tiny wings will reach the mango tree. And it has happened. And right now you can hear the python gulp the sparrow. So question in front of you is, did Garuda, the eagle, do the right thing? How do you answer this question? Yes. To the data points that were available to Garuda, it was the right thing. Yeah. And if he had more data points, would he have still done the same thing? No. What would the python call him then? <laughs> you see, you saw the entire story from the point of view of the sparrow. But see from the point of view of the python. If I told the same story from the point of view of python, starving for several days, wondering what's going to happen, when suddenly an eagle appeared and dropped the sparrow into his mouth. <laughs> suddenly it becomes such a noble act. So karma is not just about action and reaction, it's also about subjectivity. Who thinks it is good? For whom is it good? When is it good? In foresight or in hindsight? Until you add subjectivity into it, my truth and your truth. The story has three truths, or four truths one can say. There is Garuda, Garuda's truth, there is the sparrow's truth, there is the python's truth, there is the yaman's truth. When you understand this notion of subjectivity, you understand the idea of karma. Thank you. Thank you very much.